We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, we're on social media, too. Uh, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Best way is to get questions to us is go through the website. That way they don't get lost. But we're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we're going to have a discussion on house rules, tabletop games, based on a topic suggestion from Charles Baroche, who contacted us on MeWe saying a webisode on house rules might be fun. Well, thanks for the topic suggestion, Charles. I got to say, it's not quite a question, but I think it fit, right? Like, I think we're still answering a question here. I think it's a good topic. I, I, I was thinking about that. I'm like, it's not really a question for the Ask the Bellhop, but no, he wants to hear us talk about house rules. So I'm up for that. Uh, first off, I don't have a nice Todd Crapper intro or a, a, a definition panda with us to define it, but basically by house rules, what I mean, and maybe Sean will disagree, but I think we're probably all on the same page, is any rules that you add and apply to a game you're playing that aren't in the rule book, that aren't in the book, aren't in the, 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 the core rules and the FAQ or whatever. And I think it also includes rules for situations that aren't covered in the book. Now that more goes into role-playing games where if you have a set way of handling a certain situation that's not covered in the book, that's also a house rule. One of the most common examples of that is what do you do when a die falls on the floor? You're not going to find that in many rule books. Actually, I don't think I've ever seen that. I want to write a game just so I can put a rule for what happens if the dice fall on the floor, just for that sake. But I think that also falls under house rules, right? Uh, though that's partially social contract too. But what do you do if a dice is cocked? What do you do if it falls on the floor? Uh, what do you do if someone bumps the board? All those kind of things. You may have, uh, like I said, house rules. It's, it's the rules that are different if I go to my place and play or if I go to Sean's place to play, where we're talking role play, if I go play under... Uh, Kevin Doak's Warhammer game if he's like we we don't use these rules and we use these rules what are those that's what I mean by house rules so the uh, the Wikipedia definition and I, I agree I completely agree with what you use but just to, to sort of do a little more concise the official Wikipedia definition is house rules are unofficial modifications to official game rules adopted yep. by individual groups of players house rules Fair. may include the removal or alteration of existing rules or the addition of new rules. There. Yeah, that's where whoever wrote that on Wikipedia writes better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that sums it up pretty good, right? So so anything that's not in the book, whether whether you're adding to the book or anything you want to take out of the book. I think that's a basic thing. Now, uh, we're going general. We're talking tabletop. Uh, this is not just a board gaming podcast. We also talk about RPGs. And here is somewhere where there is a definite divide, a definite split, a different difference in opinion. Because in general... House ruling is discouraged in most board games because it's a game and the rules are the rules and must be followed. Whereas it's honestly the opposite in most RPGs. Almost every RPG I own that's come out since 1980 or later has a rule, usually called rule zero, that states you can ignore the rules if you want to. Yeah, and it's interesting. And I, well, I think one thing you'll also find, uh, even split again between the board gamers, is the you know, the, the family gamers, the, the fun gamers yeah. versus the competitive gamers. Obviously, if you are a competitive gamer, there are rules that need to be followed or winning mm -hmm. means nothing. But yeah. if you've got a game that, oh, you know what? It's a good game, but it would be way more fun if we got, had a, a way to refresh the deck a little mm -hmm. more often, then you know, house rule and all of a sudden that game gets to the table more often because it's yep. a little bit more fun and you're not selling it off because it just didn't do it for you. Um, and I've seen that a lot in BGG forums where you get mm -hmm. a, a certain type of player who just wants to get more use out of the games they own. And Fair. a little tweak will get that to the table. Yeah, I, th I think the key thing there, and this is pretty much what I put down in the notes because uh, we're, we're not as scripted as usual tonight. Uh, I think the key thing there is, is it a competition or not? Are you are you playing a game, using the term a game? Is there a winner? Is someone trying to win? Is there going to be a winner tonight? So in board games, in general, even party games, are pretty much co competitions, right? There's, there's a winner, there's a loser. Everyone in the competition needs to be playing by the same rules and on the same page. Whereas RPGs, again, in general, there are exceptions, aren't competitions. There's no winner. It's all about having a good time together, playing through experiencing and creating a story rules aren't important 
as keeping the game flowing, keeping things interesting, keeping immersion, um, and just making things as exciting as they can be. The one rule you'll hear about in modern games is the rule of cool, where what's more interesting to the story at this moment, that's what the rule means. Now, what about, um, when we're talking about RPG, what about Adventure League? Uh, is there a house ruling, a rule in Adventure League? Like, are they allowed to modify, verify, or modify, change things? So, yeah, I did say there's exceptions. So, when competition is added to RPGs, that's when rule adherence comes back. That's when rule zero gets thrown out the window. And that's when I, where you tend to see that as organized play. As well as tournaments. Yes, there are tournaments. And what you generally have there is multiple players play through the same adventure or the same story under different DMs, all using the same rules, rule system. And here's where you want the rules to be followed. You don't, they, they, they allow for some modification by the GM, but not of the rules or the letter of the module. Like you have to do this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, but how you do it may be different. There is more room for interpretation. But what the goal is there is you want the player to know what to expect when they get to the table. So same thing. This is why board games have codified rules is when you sit down, everyone is going to be playing. Everyone knows what to expect. Everyone knows what's happening. It's the one thing everyone has at com in common at the table is the rules. So I can gather people from all over the world who've never met each other, sit down to play a D&D Adventures League table, and we all have that one thing in common. We all know the rules. Well, assuming the players know the rules. But we all should know the rules. You know how to make a strength check. You know how to make an attack roll. You know what hit points are. You know what all that is. The, and the goal is to have a common experience between all the players. Now, this is different because as time has gone on, Adventures League in particular is very different from when I ran Living Forgotten Realms. When I ran D&D Living Forgotten Realms, which is part of the RPGA, which was the organized play for fourth edition before, you literally had to take a rule test to become a GM. I had to go online and it was a time test where I had to, you're allowed to use the books because one of the skills as a game master is to be able to look up stuff in the books, but there's no way you had enough time to look up everything. Like you had to have a good general knowledge and some of it was like, what's the AC of a boulette? And yeah, I had to look that up. I don't know. But then something else was like, how do you calculate what are the various modifiers that apply when fighting on a rain soaked hill, right? And you needed to know, well, there could be fog, there could be weather and so on. And there was a test you had to take. They've dropped that. That's no longer required. So that's a good show that they don't care as much. Plus, the adventures are much more open, not linear, and open to GM interpretation. Now, that said, every Adventure League module starts off with a section that is basically the rules for what rules you can ignore and modify. So it'll say, like, you can't kill this NPC, you can't do this, you can't burn down this shop because it's supposed to be a living world. So there's still rules, but they have gotten looser over the years. Whereas if you're playing at your home table, all of that's out the window. Do what you want. And that's encouraged by the company, which is also a slight change. The 3.5 and 3.0 rules for D&D in particular wanted everyone's table to feel the same. So you could go to the next city over, post in your friendly local game store, I'm looking for a group and join in and play. They seem to have finally moved away from that and, and again, gotten more lax. But there was definitely a... a focus on rules at that time right uh whereas i guess it, you, you, it's interesting because we talk about you know everyone sits down and knows the same whereas you look at some games and uh over time they have become uh distinct from their rules for instance yes. i would be interested to know how many copies of monopoly out there actually even have a rule book in them i mean i yeah. I never had a copy of, uh, I mean, now in the modern ones probably more often, but in the older copies of Monopoly, they, I mean, those rules just disappeared. Uh, and that's a lot of why some of the house ruling on Monopoly, mm -hmm. and I think that's some of the, the most famous house rulings exists in Monopoly. Everyone knows about uh, the variety of them. It became about because those rules weren't in the box anymore. Yeah. Uh, they disappeared. They got thrown away. Everyone thought they knew the game and played, and it just evolved um slowly uh, i was reading an interesting article the other day about learning from monopoly and one of the things you can learn is that you should develop your game so that it flows naturally and yeah. one of the reasons that house rules get developed because a game doesn't flow naturally and mm -hmm. and people have 
introduced ways to make that game flow in a way that the playtesters and designers should have maybe thought about doing it. Possibly everything. thought of. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, there's definitely, a, actually, once we talk about this a bit more, I do want to talk about some specific examples, including the, the popular Monopoly ones, which I think everyone listening to this is probably knows of them, but there are people out there that have no idea. Now, I know back in the day, though, a lot of the rules used to be on the cover of the box. That was the thing, and box topping, right? Yeah, was a, was the thing, Monopoly. So, so, often, yeah. well, I mean, so many so games Monopoly at the time, was one. Like yeah. a lot of the games at the time. So, if you, as long as you didn't lose the lid, you didn't lose the rules. But, like, to be honest, I, it, a lot of games were oral traditions back then. Monopoly, almost all the games, I learned to play from someone else. So, yep. Yep. but a lot of what people did to house rule games, though, was to make them less competitive and more open and more fun, uh, especially for families. So you didn't want to hurt someone's feelings, so you get rid of the backstabby rules. Right. Or you want to make the game simpler because auctions are complicated versus you land on a spot and get a thing. So that's where a lot of that came from. And I think people, while trying to make the games more friendly, made them worse. Like they, oh, they <laughs> basically ruined the games, right? Yeah. Like that's kind of the problem. Um, like you mentioned earlier, though, the, the whole tie-in here, though, is, is is the game meant to be competitive or not? And that's where, like you said, the the where most people are going to break the rules are games where you're looking for the experience. Like the most common house rule, my entire house that gets used the most often is when we play concept, we throw the scoring out the window. We play, I don't even know if we don't even play teams properly. We literally play whoever guesses the right answer gets to be the person giving the clues next time. There's nowhere in the book that says that it's not even suggested, but amusingly, there is a spot from the designer where they say, throw out the scoring rules, so, which I'm like, why'd you even put them in there? But I think it's just for that player. Like yep. last week, we were talking about a certain Carcassonne player locally. That guy needed those scoring rules to be in concept, I think. So so party games are definitely one where no one cares who wins. And if no one cares who wins, no one cares about the rules because it's no longer a competition. It's now just, meh, we'll just keep doing it. And Jeff asks, uh, is it a house rule if the concept rule book has a sidebar? And I would say yes, because you have to make an active choice to go with yeah. either A or B. And that choice is the house rule. You know, it's, in it's, our house, we play this this version of the rules, even though even though they are both legitimate versions of the rules. Yeah, it's not actually listed as an official variant. What it basically says, it doesn't have a sidebar that says you can throw this out. It says, here are scoring rules if you need them, is basically the way it's worded. Whereas I think I don't need them. But yeah, it's, it's variance versus versus house rules is definitely a thing. Which variance you use, I think, is a form of house rules. Um, but they're not your own. Like, they're they're not house-specific. They're right. Well, they probably are house-specific, but they're not created by you. You didn't add anything to the rules. But what options you play with. Because uh, there's one I don't have in the show notes. I've got to try to remember later. For Terraforming Mars, I thought of, which is definitely one that, that's a mix of variants that are in the book. And it's and to me that's a good thing. Like if a designer knows that people are house ruling, they should be released as official variants. And that's something that's coming more and more common with social media and sites like Board Game Geek, where someone will propose it and then eventually the designer will get involved and go, Oh wow, that's a great concept. Yeah. And that happened recently. I don't know how it's gonna end in the long run, but with Gorinto. We were playing Gorinto for player, and I came up with a, a different way to do a couple things. Cause I'm like Two of the problems we found with the game was the, the fourth player not having enough interaction and four players being slow and not getting enough drafting. And he's like, well, just do this or this. And we went back and forth and came up with some cool ideas. And then he's he's like, wow, I like those. I got to talk to the designer. So it's possible some of those will end up in the final game. And I like the fact that we're seeing that, that we'll see an official FAQ or an official thread saying, hey, here's a different way to play our game that people have discovered either makes it more fun or at least gives more options. Yeah, well, and definitely the the introduction of social media and the worldwide concept of uh, not playtesting after release because we don't we don't <laughs> we don't like that we don't think that no. should be needed, but no. just because even if you have playtested a game uh, and you're happy with its results, that doesn't mean that someone else isn't going to come up with something you never could have thought of yeah. uh, or used something in a in a different way. Sometimes it's a mistake that turns out to be beneficial. Or sometimes it's just that particular group likes playing in a way that uh, is different than yours. You know, I, I see oh, time and time again on the BGG forums, I've seen people who's like, you know, I don't like this game, but I'm going to house rule it this way, this way, this way, this way. Yeah. And our guys are, and, and we're, and we're going to play it all the mm -hmm. time. And that's not something I'm interested in. If I don't like a game, I'm not going to redesign it uh, because it's 
I, personally, I feel like the designer has a vision, and I just see that vision, and that game's not mm -hmm. for me. But the fact that there are people out there uh, like that is a good thing. You know, it's getting that game out there, you know, purchased and played. That, and I think most people, not necessarily most people listen to this podcast, most people listen to this podcast are probably closer to the way we play, which is multiple games a few times. But there are definitely people out there that buy one or two games a year and play the heck out of them. Oh, yeah. And those are the people that are going to house rule. Like, like we, our group of friends uh, has a group that play Catan, but they have full war rules. They hated the fact that it wasn't interactive enough. And they had this very cutthroat, very war-based, they produced a book. Like, they could probably publish their variant if, like, the Catan license wasn't so tight. Like they, they have spent a lot of years play testing this. Uh, there's, there's a tackle box involved with extra bits. Like, like it's a whole thing and it, it looks like a good game, but at that point to me, you're not playing Catan. The ones I like to see that are a little more common are just the, we feel the game's too short. So we play an extra turn or we feel the game's too loose and we cut it a turn early. Or like you said, we reshuffle the deck once or, yeah. And, and those are nice, quick, simple fixes that are basically, are we having fun at this time? Why don't we continue this fun? And it's probably not going to ruin the overall experience in any way. Yeah. And I see, you'll sometimes see little things, little changes uh, in a game. Like I know when the Monster Box of Monsters came out, they introduced a, a refresh, the, uh, refresh the shop rule uh, in uh, the Harry Potter last thing, which I am sure came out of, you know, BGG forums and people house ruling the fact mm. that Every once in a while, you could get something where it was just tiny cards on the yeah. uh, on the play field. Yeah, and, everything's too expensive, you know, and you don't want to. You want to be able to balance it. You don't want to be able to just ah, oh, whenever wipe it and you know wipe it until you get something you want. But you know they needed a little something because all of a mm -hmm. sudden you know you start off with five points and oops, you accidentally dealt out something where everything costs seven. Yeah, yeah, mulligan rules in card games are very common. Yeah. But I, either as host rules or sometimes included in the game. Like even when we used to play Magic the Gathering, I'm pretty sure we had a rule before the official rule. If you drew all land, you get or all creatures, you got to redraw. It's interesting. Right? I, the, the new the new version of Mulligan in the game is very different. Um, it's actually so if you choose to take a Mulligan and you can for any reason, uh, you then get a chance. You then draw another seven cards, but only keep six of them, and then you yeah. can Mulligan again. And only have five. Only get four, five, three, and, and yeah. so far, so you can. Yeah, it's it's really interesting the way they've done that, and it can really change because you can mulligan for any reason, just to really get that. You know. Yeah. If if your if your deck relies on one specific card, yeah. you, you can, might want to take those multiple mulligans. Yeah. You can yeah. Do it. Like like I, remember, I know sorcerer being probably the most closest modern version of magic we played. Yes, I know it's not magic. Uh, it had a mulligan rule that had to do with if you have no minions in your hand, yep. you can redraw it with no penalty just to, until you have minions. I remember Keyforge had something. I don't remember what. Yeah, there was something. There was something. There was something. But yeah, those are common. But overall, I got to admit, I'm, I'm on Sean's page. I have always been a big proponent of playing by the rules as written. Uh, again, the designer put the rules there for a reason. And unless I see an official variant from the designer, I tend to stay away from them. But I consume a lot of games. If there's a part of a game I don't like, I'll probably just play a different game I like more. Or yeah. if there's a part of the game I don't like, I'm probably going to tolerate it because I like the rest of the game. I'm not one to house rule off. And there are a couple that I do, which, again, I'm going to mention some specifics later. Because they don't actually change the gameplay. They just speed it up and things like that, like allowing simultaneous play with a game that doesn't actually have it, stuff like that. But I prefer to play the game raw. The one thing I personally insist on and this is something I think everyone should do, and it's like basically the thing you teach your kids is try it before you add the ketchup on it, is play the game. Like, don't go online, see the those rules, and try use them right away. Like, play the game normal with the full rules, in my opinion, at least twice before you start house ruling something. Give, give the designers, developers, and publishers enough credit that they knew what they were doing instead of walking in and house ruling right away. That's a that's a personal opinion. Like, if anyone was playing any of my games, I'd be offended to hear, see, oh, I read this, and this sounds dumb, so I changed it before our first game. I'd be offended. I'd be like, come on, just try it. Try it with the actual rules first. Yeah. And uh, a music anecdote to that is the Fate? No, it's not Fate. Burning Wheel role-playing system. Now, I don't own Burning Wheel, but I own Mouse Guard. And Luke Grain is very much of the same opinion of my game is written in a certain way to evoke a certain experience using certain mechanics to do that. And you should follow it. Except he's very pedantic about it and says it right in the rule book that thou shall not change any of these rules or house rule this game, which I got to admit felt very off putting. 
And when I read that book, there was some stuff that sounded really weird. I was tempted to just throw out the window. And we sat down to play Mouse Guard for the first time with our usual Monday night group. And we played two sessions. We made characters. We said, you know what? I don't like this rule, but we're going to try it. We're going to play two sessions using all the rules in this book to the fullest, every card, every die roll, every minus one plus one, and see how it works. And sure enough, it worked. And it was one of the most limiting role-playing games I've ever played that somehow felt freeing because it was so limiting. Like, it was just, because our options were limited, we were more creative, I think is a, is a way to look at it. Oh, absolutely. All right. So one other role-playing thing I do want to mention is the whole OSR movement, right? Old school rules. So we talked about, and this, this basically comes out of it. I said, like, the 3.0, 3.5 rules for D&D, which came out in the year 2000, was a, a concentrated effort to make every table playing D&D &D the same. That was the goal of the system. That was the goal Monty Cook had. He wanted you to be able to walk into anyone's, I'm going to stop using basement, walk into anyone's game room and sit down and play D&D &D and know how to play and be able to play with them, which I do think was a valiant effort and there is merit to that concept. But people fought back against that. And to me, that's when the OSR movement out. No OSR is for old school renaissance, old school revival. The point is going back to an older style of play where the thing was they didn't know they needed rules for everything or decided consciously they didn't need them. The main one I think of where they didn't know is no one even thought to put a skill system in D&D. Like just the concept hadn't happened. Why would I need a list of things my character can and can't do? I'm a warrior. Of course I can dip over wheelbarrows and I can smith my own swords and I'm a wizard. Of course I can read and write. Right. Like, and what that goes to is because there were gaps in the rules, everything was house rule. Like there was no rule. And that gets to the concept of rulings over rules where the GM, DM, game master, whatever you want to call it is basically a moderator, someone who is there to interpret the rules and extrapolate them into different situations. And there is a huge push to go back to that. And a lot of modern story games are really push that, though they're not necessarily OSR. Even if you're not doing dungeon crawls, if you're having a romantic date, it's still more about rulings over rules, which is definitely a shift in the way people look at it. And, and a move towards house rules being the rule. And I have to say, when it comes to RPG, I tend to, I tend to lean this way, and I know you and I differ on this one, yep. which is funny because you've been my GM for 90% yep. of my role-playing life. Uh, but the... the to me, a lot of what a role-playing game brings to the table is its environment. Uh, the reason I love Warhammer is not because of their goal-to-hit table. It's because of the world of role Warhammer. Uh, and now, there are absolutely some parts of the mechanics that I enjoy. I enjoy career advancement uh, within it. But realistically... It is the world of Warhammer that I enjoy playing in. Mm -hmm. And if you told me I had to use Thaco instead of a D100, okay, yeah. I, I want to play in the world of Warhammer. <laughs> and that system happened to bring that to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there's there's a whole lot of that. But I can definitely see, you know, both sides of it. You know, again, especially as we get into the more modern games, these, again, we've got to this modern world of playtesting and this modern world uh, of of game development where designers are able to put so much more time and thought and effort mm -hmm. into their games so that when they deliver it to you you are doing them a disjustice to ignore what they did yeah <laughs> so my, my big thing is at least try it i tend to stick with ross now the most important thing though if you are ever going to use house rules is the the thing we've mentioned many times have the conversation before the game starts we're we can call it session zero you can call it whatever you want session zero is a role-playing term but it applies to board games you should never ever surprise someone with a host rule it is always something that should be discussed before the game starts possibly before even the game night's planned Especially if you're going to play some big epic game like Twilight Imperium. I don't want to show up to your house and find out you're using some variant where you start five turns in where everyone's got a full fleet. Maybe what I enjoy about Twilight Imperium is the buildup, and you just took that away from me. You need to have everyone on the same page and get everyone to agree to every house rule before you start playing. Now, RPGs, that's a little harder because there is that rulings over rules. 
But if there's certain things that you've codified for your group, like, yeah, there's no rules for skills in D&D, but we use a D6 and we add our stat, tell people that, right? Like, let people know. They, in, in RPGs in general, that's the kind of stuff, I, in my opinion, you should document. You should have a, a sheet, a set of rules for your house rules. And if it is, the DM's going to wing it every time. Fair enough. That's your house rule. But board games even more so, right? Any game where it's a competition. Again, if your RPG is a competition and you're playing for money or you're running through the same adventure the other group did last week to see who did better, whatever it is. If, if you're making it a game, if you're making a competition with winners and losers, everyone's got to be on the same page. Everyone has to know all the rules at the table, house rules and official, what's been added in and what's been taken out. And this, this gets to be a problem in some ways because of what we talked about earlier with Monopoly, where people think they know the rules. Uh, you know, the number of, of rules that exi- that are house rules that people aren't aware are house rules, uh, especially on games that, you know, have a history behind them yeah. that have evolved in that method of, you know, verbal uh, verbal explanations. You've, you may have never seen a set of rules for game X, but mm-hmm. you know how to play it because you've been playing it since you were, you know, a toddler. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where, you know, most people don't know they need a session zero for Uno or for Monopoly, yeah. where I guarantee you're going to play both those games wrong 90% of the time, unless you are the kind of unless you're already aware that, that yeah. knows that these rules are all wrong. All right. I think that's a good uh, segue into actually talking about some of those examples. So what is the Uno one? I always forget. There, there's two that I know you're people mess up in to, Uno. You're not allowed to stack uh pickups on each other yeah you can't play i thought there were others so there's so you can't play a plus two then a plus two then a plus four or any of that um another is at the end of your turn if you can't play you keep drawing until you can yep a lot of people ditch that rule and you only draw one and then it passes the next player which is too forgiving uh plus it stops play and you could just keep going around which is not good and then there's something with there there's actually social deduction in uno and a lot of people don't use that well, yeah, they, um, if, if, you, you, if can you don't play, play the a, right card, you, you can get called out on it. But you can cheat. You can yeah. play oh, the yeah, wrong absolutely. card. And if no one calls you out on it, especially with the plus four change color, you're only supposed to be able to play that if you can't play. But you can play it when you can play. But then yeah. if the person next to you calls you out on it, yeah. you then have to draw the cards. Again, this is, I don't play Uno enough, but there are a bunch. And again, yeah. almost all of these rules were added to make it more family friendly. Make it more family friendly. Or make it more punishing, which is yeah. a weird one. The, the fact you were allowed to stack punishments was yeah. just like a way for siblings to beat each other up in a game. Like, Basically. really? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So those are some Uno ones. What do we got from uh, Monopoly? So Monopoly, I mean, the big one that I think everyone knows of is free parking. Yeah. Uh, you know, the where, but the, it's it's different because there are so many house rule variations. There's variations on, on free parking. Yes. So what goes there? The actual rule is free parking is just that. nothing. It's nothing. Yep. It's a spot where you where absolutely nothing happens. Yet I have seen an automatic two hundred dollars. I have That's seen good. all the money from taxes or yep. all the money from auction. You know, basically chance any money cards. that goes back yep. in. Yeah, I've seen all the money. I've seen money from chance cards. All the money is like terrible. Like whoever oh, yeah. came up with that, <laughs> it, like it becomes the bank. Yeah, essentially. Cool. So again, what this was put in was to make the game more fun to have a catch up mechanic. So so your little brother who doesn't understand buying properties can land there and be happy and still be in the game. But it's terrible because the whole point of the game is to take money out. That's how yeah. you lose, is to run out of money. And if you keep putting money back into that system, like, no wonder so many people think Monopoly's too long. Like, well, and Monopoly's already too long because even if you play by the rules, you've got between five and six rolls before you get more money anyway. Uh, you yeah, know, you gotta get around the board. Yeah, to get around, the, you know, it only takes five or six rolls to get around that board generally, and then you're gonna have more money. Even you know, so the the fact that you're adding another mechanic to to add more money into the system is essentially falsely inflating the economy of the system, yes. and that doesn't work. We've got all sorts of economic uh, professors everywhere across the world who will tell you that you know false inflation. <laughs> Fails. Yeah, see, Monopoly would work if, as that happened, the values of the properties all went up. Right. <laughs> then there we get go. a more realistic simulation <laughs> by adding more money go. in we the pot. In, the money's we need, worth we less. need inflation, inflation on, on prices as well as inflation on income. Yes. 
Uh, so another one I've heard many times is if you land on Go, you get double the money. Yep. Which, again, just adding more money in for no reason. And then, of course, the biggest, the one that most people don't even know is wrong, is the auction. Because in Monopoly, when you land on a property, you don't have to buy it. You can say no. Yep. And then that property goes up for auction. And what's interesting is you could bid in that auction and possibly get it cheaper than you would have just for landing on it. Yep. Uh, but the auction is, again, as a family game, the auction tends to be too complex for younger players, or at least is thought of as too complex for younger players, and gets thrown out. Uh, I never I never knew about the auction until the first time I played it on as a, as a computer game. Oh, there you go. Okay. That was, See, my family never used auction. I played have the free parking rule. Yeah. A like lot I, of, I've seen it. Like, like even even a the, lot. The, a lot of them the will have a toggle, especially like because a lot of the more common house rules are toggleable yeah. in the computer games. Because again, that's how people grew up playing Monopoly, and it ruins yeah. the game for them if they don't want to play. If they don't play it that way. Although I, I just want them all to sit down and play the real way once, and probably go, "Hey, this is better than I remember." Uh, there's all also right. there's also some house rules about landing on. Uh, I believe it's your own properties. It's not one I've ever played with, but it's one I heard of recently where there, there's, you can like get money if you land on your own property sort of thing. It, again, it's another one of these that. things that just ends the game, which is yeah. already a painfully long game. <laughs> yeah, I've also seen the other thing is you have to build your properties evenly. So on, you have to build each one, one at a time. Right. Where I've seen people where they build a hotel right away on just one spot. You can't do that. Right. But again, that, that just increases the random factor that someone's going to lose there and get eliminated from the game prematurely yeah. which i guess at least it doesn't make the game longer uh not getting income while you're in jail is another one that's a house rule yeah it's because you still get income yeah, yeah. don't you but yeah, but yeah. some people will house rule it so that when you're in jail so you're in jail so, you can't. so they're trying to add some realism to monopoly <laughs> all right I, there was an interesting one where I had someone had built a board and they built railroad tracks between the railways and you were allowed to cross over. I thought that was interesting sounding at least. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of variations. So we're using Monopoly as our main example because there's so many. Uh, some other ones. Here's an interesting one where people take a social game and, and break the rules. And that, and I see this happen every group you played it with, is play Hanabi or The Mind with two different groups of people and see what their, I mean, their house rules because... You're not allowed to do what most people do in both those games. Like in the mind, you are not supposed to communicate at all. So whether that's the, I hold my hand up, I almost put it, or how close. The one I've noticed in the mind, watching people play, is how close they lean in to the table. So if they got they want to play soon, they lean in. And if they want to play, they, they're like, oh, I got a bad card. They lean way back. Technically, you're breaking the rules. But you know what? It's the mind. It's fun. It's just a... It's just a, a, a an experience. And Hanabi, the ways people hold their cards, my God. Or the, this is a two, and this is a two. <laughs> you see it all the time. Um, but you know what? If you're having fun, who cares, right? The, to me, that's actually part of Hanabi. And I had a discussion uh, on Twitter the other day because I've only ever played it digitally. And, and was, I'm like, I can't even see how you can play that without. Kind of, it's just a kind of silly game. And the only thing you can guess is... Uh, when someone has marked something as as a color or right. a number, you might be able to get, to to get something out of that based on timing, but mm. uh, but really you're you're just kind of playing it to kill time. <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, Whereas where, the actual game with with the the social cues and the yeah, hints. Yeah. Well, and, and there's nothing wrong with the way you're saying something being part of it. I mean, that's I, I, unless the rules outright state you know must speak in monotone. Uh, you know that's part that of the fun. No, they do. They say you're not allowed to to give additional info with how you are saying the numbers or the colors. So you're not supposed to be like that's a two, you know, with your yeah. five. Fa I've seen so it's a music. Yeah. Like it, it, it's almost a hobby of mine. As you watch people play Hanabi, oh, what's this group gonna do, right? And every yeah. group has their own idiosyncrasies. Yeah. And then if you mix those players, oh, it's so funny because the mix signals. Right. They're like, whoa, whoa, wait, you just turned that card side. What the hell does that mean in your group? You know, <laughs> it is. It's it's amusing to see. Uh, so here's one that I actually think is a great house rule that should be part of the rules. And that is playing Carcassonne or any other tile laying game, Soro or any of those. And that is after your turn, draw the tile as opposed to at the start of your turn. Because in Kark, you're supposed to draw the tile. Literally in the rules of Kark, you're also supposed to show all the other players so they can help you place it. But do it at the end because that lets you plan ahead. That gives you every other player's turn to figure out where that tile is going to fit. It like literally, I would say triples 
the speed of being able to play cart if you know what your next tile is. And even BGA does it. BGA shows you up in the top right what your next tile is going to be. Uh, it doesn't show you your tile. It shows you the next tile. I thought it showed your next oh, tile. Oh, yes, your, no, you're right. It does. It shows you the next tile for everybody up center and then your own tile. Your own your, tile yeah. on, on, uh, yeah. up by your name. Yeah. Because this is just such a good variant to just to speed up what's what's a – that's not a slow game, but it, it takes out a lot of the AP. And like I said, every tile late game should have this rule. This is, this is to me, it should be in the rules, not a house rule. The only the only problem is it does give you a little bit of advantage if you know what your card what your card is going to be and you're seeing what everyone else's card is as they're as they're laying it out because you can yeah but that only matters if you're gonna be a dink and influence them <laughs> don't put it there like like you what your tile you have shouldn't influence what they're playing right because you can't see the next player's tile yeah I can just see the one that's currently being played in my next one now in a way like okay there there are people out there that believe in the gods of fate and don't actually believe in randomness that think that next tile is theirs. It might upset those people yep. or the people who like card counting and are going to get upset that you drew the last four before your turn when you draw the last four, because technically you're drawing the next player's tile instead of your own. But come on, like, like it, that's ridiculous. It's the same people that if I have to deal out five cards from the top of the deck to everyone, would get upset whether I grab a stack of five and hand them to you or if I go around the table, one, two, three, four, five. If the deck is random, it doesn't matter. Yep. All right, I think a, a hobby game we should probably talk about, just because there are a bunch of variants for it, is Catan. Um, Catan has a lot of variants out there. I think just because it's so popular, it probably has as many house rules as Monopoly. And from what I'm hearing... Catan is starting to turn into Monopoly this way in that people are learning it from their friends, teaching their friends, and there is now becoming this verbal tradition of Catan because everyone sees that rulebook and it scares them. Now, one of the things to note in the Catan rule, but half of its background and, and talking about the, the time period and farms and all this stuff, the actual rules aren't that big, but the book's like thick, like 13 pages versus, you know, the top of a box when you were growing up is a big deal. Now, one of the ones I actually like and I think is a pretty solid one is you ignore the robber. You ignore the, the when you roll a seven, you lose half your resources, move the robber and steal something for the first X turns. And this is where people seem to, to vary. Um, what this does is it lets people actually start building up resources early and doesn't mess anyone over at the beginning of the game so you can start building an engine. Now, the debate out there is how many turns. I personally think it should go at least once around the table. But some people actually think you should go around the table twice or three times before the robber comes in. I would say at least. Don't just give, like, the first player an advantage or second. Like, the first turn, time a player rolls. I see that one quite a bit. Now, I don't know. Ooh, Sean is frozen on me. So hopefully we haven't lost. All good here. All right. Your Skype just froze. I don't know why. So I thought that was neat. Um, I don't think you played enough Catan to really comment on it. Yeah, no, I, I'm... Catan's all right. I just, again, I've never one of those yeah. games that I've gotten uh, deeply involved in. All right. So to me, that's that's a solid house rule. I have nothing wrong with it. But again, agree before you start playing, because that does change the dynamics of the game. Now, there are also a number of people who play with some form of variant for when you, the dice are rolled and you get nothing. I am not a fan of this one, because almost all of these, you get something when it happens, and I've seen people give you a wild card resource, a resource of your choice, I've seen gold tokens that you can trade in. And when you do this, you literally are changing the balance of the game. Because by giving people a reward for rolling badly, it then devalues the good spots on the map. And the sixes and eights are good for a reason and are in place for a reason and are a big part of the strategy of where to push your starting cities. And if you start using that rule, you're going to have people that want to build on the twos and twelves, hoping they get nothing just to abuse that system. Like, to me, it's off theme and changes the balance. And to go with that, I don't know how this is one that I've actually seen where people don't realize they're playing wrong, is those tokens with the numbers on them go out in alphabetical order. There's letters on them that go A, B, C, D, E for a reason because you spiral out from the desert. And that's an important part of the game because it makes sure you never get a six and an eight next to each other. And I don't know how many games of Catan I've sat down where people randomize those tokens and it completely ruins the board. Because you just put one six next to one eight and let someone build there, they're probably going to win the game just because of the laws of probability. So those are house rules for Catan. I don't think anyone should use. You should throw them out. 
Now, one I do like is players got together and hated the randomness in Catan because it's it's a 2, 2d6. And while, in my opinion, the bell curve on 2d6 is pretty solid, some people get really upset that 2s and 12s get rolled too often or whatever, or they think that, that it's too good. So what they did is they put together a deck of cards that were the full distribution of 2d6, which is, I think, what, 36? So you have one, two, and then three, whatever the, the proper bell curve is. And what you do is you use every card in the deck and then shuffle and start again. So you have to do it that way because then you get a standard bell curve every game. So yes, two and 12 are only going to come up once before the deck shuffles. Some people prefer that. Uh, that was popular enough that Claus Tuber and Mayfair Games put out a deck that says Catan on it and it's themed. So that is a big deal, a, a big house rule that people enjoy enough and were popular enough that the designer said, hell yeah, and put out an official expansion for his base game so that you get that perfect bell curve every time. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. Randomness is randomness. Like, I don't love the idea of the so, sort of messing with randomness. Just the bell curve is something that exists over, yeah. you know, a thousand rolls, not something that exists in 36 rolls. Correct. Um, you should not get, unlikely that you would get a bell curve in 36 rolls. Yeah, in one game of Catan. Where some people want that. So now, if you want that, there's a deck you can buy. Yeah, that's true. So here you go. Here's a perfect example. Jeff Seuss is in our chat room and had no idea that the letters on the token mean something, or he's being sarcastic. I'm not sure which. <laughs> but it's possibly he's being sarcastic, but I would not be surprised if Jeff was taught to play Catan and never knew that the letters mean something. Yep. All right. Uh, here's one that we can get Sean back into the conversation because I know he plays one is card games, specifically cooperative card games, so Pandemic, Forbidden Desert, playing with open hands. Um, I A couple games actually recommend it, but a lot of people recommend playing Pandemic or Forbidden Desert with open hands. Now, I think you do that for Harry Potter, don't you? Yeah, Harry Potter is generally... I, I'm trying to remember if they actually specifically state, but I believe it is fully open information as designed that okay. way. Um, because, again, it's a fam it, is, it is generally a family game. Um, but yes, uh, it's something whereas I would be more cautious of it in a compet in a, in a more competitive group because quarterbacking could absolutely be an issue, um, yeah. especially because of, of, of the asymmetry in the characters. Um, as you move up, as you move on a little further, uh, and, and develop your, your player powers in later years, um, there's definitely certain ways that certain characters can be played better. Um, and, and certain, you know, hey, you're playing Neville, so you want to try and maybe build your deck more this way because mm -hmm. it, it will work better because I've seen it work better. Fair enough. But yeah, I think, I think it's a solid variant. But yeah, the quarterbacking, right? Because one of the okay. things that prevents quarterbacking is everyone having their own resources and people not knowing what that is. But you know what? When you're playing Pandemic, how many yellow cards did you have? Wait, did you have a blue? Like, just play them face up and you won't have that. That conversation. Yeah, a uh, lot of people aren't good at, at memorizing, at counting cards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and on a on a cooperative game, there's no need to be good at co at counting cards, right? It's exactly. Not like that's that's not what the game's about, and that's true of almost any of these games, right? Like, it, there's no reason to count cards. So that leads me to something else too, and that is scoring. Whether you keep your scoring open or closed. Uh, for example, Power Grid, by the rules, your money's secret. And that is by design so it reduces AP. So you don't try to figure out if you can outbid someone by one minute or not. Or not. Or like, uh, sorry, outbid someone by one $1 or $2. And it's by design. But a lot of people, mainly because they hate the paper money, play with poker chips. And as soon as you throw poker chips in Power Grid, you can now count. And I've noticed these are the same people that say, well, Power Grid's too long a game. So there, you got to realize, and there's, there's another point to this, right? Realize that with house rules that there is a cost to using them. Now, that cost may be just a matter of having to teach everyone your new rules, but it might also change the balance of the game and change the overall experience. Well, and in many cases, it is intended to change the balance of the game, but yes. there may be unintended changes on top mm. of that, right? You know, let's, yes. let's, add in, let's add in the money to free parking so that everyone yep. has more fun, except now you have, you know, game goes on. coupled <laughs> the length of the game. So... 
All right, I'm just going to fire up a couple. We've been talking about this for a while. So here's some ones I like. King of Tokyo, always use power up. I don't know if that's a house rule, but it's an expansion that to me is necessary. Always give people a starting power. I personally like to give people two powers to pick from, so you draft two powers. You know why that is? I love asymmetric games. And the whole point of using power up is that each of the monsters in King of Tokyo is unique. Why not start them off unique instead of requiring someone to roll three hearts on the dice before they get to do the cool thing? So that's one thing that gets to the monkey. It lets you do the cool thing right at the start of the game and adds asymmetry. So that's one I recommend for King of Tokyo Power Up. Um, Ticket to Ride, scoring at the end of the game. This is an interesting one, but this gets into the whole open scoring or not. And the big thing you got to watch for is any game where you can see everyone's points during the game, you're going to have, I'm going to say, a feature of the game being knowing who's in the lead. And that encourages people to go after the player in the lead. Whereas if you hide the score, it's always a, a guess. You don't know who's in the lead. But it also means you're rewarding a different play experience. Like Sean said, you're not rewarding memorization. Whereas if scoring's hidden, you're rewarding people remembering what points everyone's at. So to me, that is not good or bad house rules. It's group dependent. It's what do you like to play? This is a big one for a lot of games where, where if you want that, uh, king making is the wrong word. It's more leader chasing where you want people to try to prevent the, you know, catch the leader, you're going to want to use open money so everyone can see. Whereas if you'd rather be surprised at the end of the game who won then and reward people who do remember who's in the lead and who did what, then you want to play the other way. And then finally, I just want to talk about RPGs just quickly. The most common rule that everyone's probably heard of is encumbrance. People like to throw that out the window. And the other one is housekeeping style rules, stuff like tracking M ammo, downtime expenses, the cost for food to drink, replacing arrows, stuff like that. Now, in most cases, I think this stuff should be waived, hand waved, thrown out of the game. If your game's about saving the world from the encroaching evil, it doesn't matter if you bought the one copper grog or the five copper elven ale when you were at the bar. Meanwhile, if your game, though, is about resource management, if you are all about surviving in a hostile desert where every ounce of water is vital and how many days of rations you can carry may be the difference between life or death, then you want to keep those rules in. Yeah, it's one of those it's one of those interesting ones where I think it you can even sort of change depending even within the same group. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, day one, you're, you know, heading out from the village to go, you know, tackle a dungeon that's right outside the village. Fine, who cares how many arrows you've got or what it or or what things cost, but when you are going to track across the desert to get to the next, you know, country, mm -hmm. well, then yeah, it does matter what you've got. And that first session, you're before you start, everyone had better detail out their backpacks that day, even yeah. though you've never done it before. Hey, we're doing a little bit of a different game today, so mm -hmm. let's do this today. Um, All right. Yeah, very true. And I've seen the exact opposite too. Where at the beginning of the game, your characters are broke, so you want to track every arrow or every penny. But then eventually, after their first horde and they kill the dragon, they have thousands of gold. Who cares if they spend one or two copper, right? Yep. So it goes both ways. But you also have to you know, you look at things like management. You know, how you've, you've got your millionaire characters. How much of that gold is with you versus how much of it? Yeah. You know, we don't all have bags of holding to carry our entire dragon horde. Or do with. we care? Or do it, we it care? It totally depends yeah. what the adventure is about. Yeah. If you want the characters to be able to afford whatever they can, they afford whatever they can. It's more about the manipulation or the politics or whatever. So I think at this point, we're going to call it. That is our conversation on house rules. Uh, I think the important thing is it doesn't matter if you like them or not. They're a thing. Just make sure you have a conversation. Make sure you talk about it. Don't ever surprise someone with a house rule. I never want to be sitting down to play a game and have you do something that's against the rules and go, oh, sorry, that's how we play it here. That should never happen. You should always know that ahead of time. Uh, again, house rules and RPGs are common, but still should be discussed. What are your standard ones? What do you do different from the core rules? What do you do different from the base rules? What rule books do you allow, don't you allow? And board games, I think in general, you can assume you're playing by the rules, unless there's an exception. because. The driving force that I think we got to from this is if the game's about a competition, if there's a winner, if you are playing to win, you need to have hard and fast rules with everyone on the same page. If you're just playing to have fun, whether that's a role-playing game or a party game, who cares? Toss the rules out of the window, go with the rule of cool, do whatever's the most fun for your group. But, but know the rules so that you can know when yes. your house rules. 
<laughs> That's very true. Yeah, always learn the game first. Try it with the rules. Trust the designer. That was something else we mentioned. T trust the designer, the publisher, the developers to have done their work and give the game a try with the full rules before making any house rules. Now that we're done our thoughts on the main topic, we're going to pop into the lobby and see what they think. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Apparently some people don't know Catan. <laughs> yes. So yeah, Jeff is true. He didn't know the letters meant something, thought it was from some German version. So I wonder, Jeff, have you enjoyed Catan or was there always a one runaway leader? Where this, someone always got screwed over, whereas someone else always seemed to have all the resources they needed? Because that's what happens when you just put them out randomly. Is is even if one player doesn't get a lucky placement, they're gonna have some other players stuck. Uh, uh, Jeff's asking, are there board games with common fan content besides Arkham Horror, and do you consider those house rules? I I guess they be, it depends. Uh, fan created content to me is not a house rule unless you change the rules. So if it's just a new scenario that uses all the rules that are in the original. I wouldn't necessarily say it, but I think in this case it counts as a house rule just for our conversation. I don't want to show up to your place to play your house to play Arkham Horror and find out we're doing a self-created scenario. You should tell me ahead of time, hey, do you want to come over and try out my self-created scenario? The uh, same thing if I sit down to a D&D &D game, I want to know if we're playing in the Forgotten Realms, we're playing in your homebrew universe, or if we're playing Eberron. Or if we're playing Eberron, but we allow Tiflings from Forgotten Realms. I want to know all that ahead of time and not be surprised by it. But there are a lot of games where people create content. Basically, anything that's scenario-based, campaign-based, there's someone out there that's made fan content. But it's also true the popular games. There are people who have made their own Catan or Carcassonne tiles. There are definitely a lot of uh, fan-created Catan reasons. Yep. Well, I think we've, we've noticed even in some games uh, where there has been fan-created or fan-included content built into the Kickstarter, yes. where you've noticed, hey, you know what? I bet this was, and sure enough, that was fan-created content because yeah. it's, it hasn't gotten that playtesting. And again, yeah. you've run into the balance issue, right? When you when you throw in a house rule, there will be almost certainly unintended effects as well as the effects that you were hoping to gain with that house rule. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely, like Gloomhaven's an example. There were, there were some scenarios we found were a little ridiculous. Yeah. And because of that, we looked it up and found out that was stuff added from the Kickstarter that was created by fans. So, which was meant to be extra hard, which is fair, but I, it would have been nice to know that ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They almost need a little, you know, car on them just so that you're aware that this, you know, wasn't play tested quite. Well yeah. Yeah. Wasn't everything else. play tested as much. But yeah. Overall, host rules are cool. Jeff, we should play Catan with the proper rules sometime. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Because, yeah, that's that's a very, that, that's, that people don't realize it, and those numbers are very important to Catan. I say you'll never have a 6 and an 8 next to each other. The 2 and 12 will never be next to each other using the proper rules. It also evenly distributes the rest of the numbers, with the 6 and the 8 being the most, because there's two sixes, two eights. If any of those touch each other, anyone that builds there is great. Um, it also changes the distribution of the different resources, and there, there's a lot of reasons. That, that you should always play with the proper. It's a spiral. You start at A, B, C, D, and you go around in a spiral to the middle of the board, skipping over the desert. And that's right in the rule book, so I don't know how that one got missed. It's part Again, of it. It's one of those things where Catan's another one. It's been around. Yeah, it's big enough it's now. Been, it's been taught by other people to others without, yeah. you know, how many people have read the rule book for Catan before playing. And then once you start hosting it, you feel comfortable because you've played it so many times already. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we didn't get any house rules from our chat today. But fair enough. As far as I can tell, everyone in our chat room really likes to follow the rules. Or at least the rules they think they know. <laughs> yep, there we go. So I, I think we're stuck that way. All right.